Today, I want to talk about a couple of teams that have not won a college football playoff national championship and about the team that has won the most over the past, well, 10 years. And all that's coming up after the bumper. Don't be cornering me. Hold up. Time. You got to help me with that, that corner sh**. <laughs> What's up, kid folk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Consider hitting the like and subscribe button because I upload a video every single day. It's always college football related, sports related. We have a good time. Today, I want to talk about how you win a college football playoff national championship in this modern era because even quarterbacks will admit to you, offense gets you to the playoff. Defense win you, wins you those championships. Now, in taking a look at, say, Oklahoma, I believe the narrative that OU doesn't play defense is dead. It finished number 15 in defensive SP Plus last year. In its final five games, Oklahoma held teams to 21 or fewer, you know, in, or, or excuse me, in five of those games. Like, it's just, it's not fair to them anymore. They returned the top edge rusher in all of college football in Nick Benito. So I'm going to include them in this. But I was really taking a look at Georgia when I had this thought about having the team that can contend for a national championship the way that Alabama did. But I also want to back up and read you something that I wrote last December about Nick Saban and his forced evolution because many of you will remember he played murder ball. He did not like throwing the ball around. He did not like high-scoring offenses. He wanted to play sound football offensively, run in the football, and play savage defense. That was how they were going to win. But, all right, check this out. 2012. It didn't matter that Air Raid Disciples Kevin Sumlin and, and Cliff Kingsbury had pulled an upset by using basically an undersized firecracker quarterback in a pyrotechnic scheme designed to run up the score, and they had beaten the man who had become one of the game's greatest coaches by recruiting the best players in the country and coaching them to execute the most mundane offense in the sport without error. A month before the A&M loss, though, Saban had lamented what the game had become with the proliferation of no-huddle, fast-paced offenses who took no time to move the ball, no substitutions between plays, and no mercy on defenses. The offensive idea was simple. Once you find a defense and a scheme you can take advantage of, keep going after that weakness and don't give it a chance to change its personnel. It's the guiding principle that Lane Kiffin used earlier last season when Ole Miss scored 48 points, and put up 647 yards of offense. 2012, Saban, the last great bastion of three yards and a cloud of dust offense, argued the spread was making the game unsafe and rooted in a teleconference with a monologue saying, it's obviously created a tremendous advantage for the offense when teams are scoring 70 points and we're averaging 49.5 points a game. With people that do those kinds of things, more and more people are going to do it. I just think there's got to be some sense of fairness in terms of asking, is this what we want football to be? Okay, last year, Alabama averaged better than 49 points per game, and I was basically playing fun with numbers, and I saw Kent State actually averaged more points per game than them, and Buffalo averaged more points per game than Oklahoma, 43 point to 43, but we're also talking about talent and how talent bears out. The other team that I think fits in here is Georgia, and I think Georgia actually has a lot more in common with 2020 Alabama than they think. I don't know that they have more in common with 2020 Alabama than Oklahoma, right? But it's there for them. Check it. Kiaris Jackson, Jermaine Burton, George Pickens. You get back Dominique Blaylock, Darnell Washington. Check it. Running backs. Rides Amir White if that's what you want to do. You also got James Cook, Kenny McIntosh, Kendall Milton. You now have a quarterback at JT Daniels. No, can throw the ball all over the yard if you want him to. 392 against Cincinnati, which had a damn good defense. And then Georgia has a damn good defense. They have dudes. They're going to get Keely Ringo back in the rotation in 21. Like, Georgia's running out of excuses for not winning an national championship for the first time since 1980. You have the parts this year. Like, I'm looking at your personnel, and I'm taking it down. I'm tearing it apart. You have it. You have more of it than Oklahoma does if we're looking at just 
five stars in composite talent, and you play at a tougher league, right? But you got an easier road to that championship game. It's cherry for Georgia right now. Who do you have to worry about in the East? Florida's in a rebuilding mode. They're going to be better than I previously thought they might be. Like, they're not going to be a cellar dweller. They're probably going to win eight or nine games, but that's it. Win the world's largest outdoor cocktail party, and you're in. Mizzou doesn't have the horses. Kentucky, Kentucky doesn't have the horses. Vanderbilt doesn't have the horses, right? Go on all the way down the list. South Carolina doesn't have the horses. Georgia ought to be there in the SEC championship, and they ought to be able to take apart the SEC West champ because you got a new quarterback at Texas A&M. Maybe it's Haynes King. Maybe it's Eli Stowe. It's going to be the first quarterback starting there since 2017, which feels like a long time ago. I mean, Baker Mayfield was leading Oklahoma to the Rose Bowl in 2017. Also, Georgia, don't squib kick, 17 points. My God. LSU, going to have a returning starter, I believe, in Max Johnson. We'll see if TJ Finley can win that job, but it'll be decent. Alabama's going to be good. We all know what Bryce Young is, but he hasn't started. Gus Malzahn is out at Auburn. They're going to be bringing in a whole different staff where they have in Brian Harson. They're going to have a whole different way of doing things, but it's going to take them a couple of years, I think, to get started. Arkansas has an opportunity to, to turn some heads, but I don't know if they're good enough to get out of the SEC West this year. Certainly, if they did, that would be an interesting game, Arkansas versus Georgia. I'm saying Georgia's set up for you in the same way that it's set up for Oklahoma. This is your window. You're running out of excuses. You are built to win on both sides of the ball right now. Is Kirby Smart going to get hell if they don't win a national championship this year? I don't think he's going to get hell, but it's going to be really difficult to outrun the Mark Richt moniker. It's going to be really difficult for us to keep betting on Georgia because like the whole joke of saying Georgia will just fail is becoming what we used to say about Clemson, right? Just at a much higher level. Like, Clemsoning was a thing until it wasn't. Until Dabo Sweeney and them said, no, 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 we win national championships here. You can retire that turn. And then for a bit, it became sooner in, right? Because Oklahoma would get to the playoff game, and they would get housed. At least Georgia has won a playoff game and got to a national championship. But we've also admitted that Georgia's been a more talented football team than Oklahoma in all of those years. So, I, again, just Georgia, you're running out of excuses. It was 